has to do with knowing your individual identity. For Douglas, knowing his birth date meant knowing who Douglas was, who Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey was. Here, Douglas spent the final years of his life in the house he named Cedar Hill, across the river from Washington, D.C. On a spring morning in 1894, a year before his death, he recorded the last entry in his diary. He described a trip to Baltimore to visit a relative of his old slave master. He was still in search of his birth date, a matter Douglas called a serious trouble. I called yesterday while in Baltimore upon Dr. Thomas Sears and learned the following fact. Captain Aaron Anthony died November 14, 1823. Working with the recorded death of his slave master, Douglas figured his own birth date as February 1817. But he was wrong. Years after Douglas died, the truth about the birth of the slave, Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, was discovered in a plantation ledger. Next to his slave name was the date, February 1818. But I suspect this search for a, an accurate birth date became a kind of obsession, uh, in part because this was somebody who was always telling his own story and always trying to understand, I suspect, even within himself, how he got from there to here. The first experience of life with me that I now remember began in the family of my grandmother and grandfather. My grandmother enjoyed the high privilege of living in a cabin with no other burden but then her support and the necessary care of the little children. Living here with my dear old grandmother and grandfather, it was a long time before I knew myself to be a slave. His grandmother is someone who interprets the world for him and helps him to understand what he sees. Her faith in him, her confidence in him, her sense that she is meant to be something very important is a part of that necessary building of himself. The woman who had taught him so much spared him the hard facts of his future as a slave, that someday soon he would be claimed as property by the man called Old Master and forced to live and work on a great plantation. When the time of my departure was decided upon, my grandmother, knowing my fears and in pity of them, kindly kept me ignorant of the dreaded event. She led me along by the hand, resisting with the reserve and solemnity of a priestess all my inquiring looks to the last. She was soon to lose another object of affection, as she had lost many before. I knew she was unhappy, and the shadow fell from her brow on me. Frederick was turned over to old master, Aaron Anthony, manager of one of the largest plantations on the eastern shore. Y Plantation covered almost 10,000 acres, included 13 farms and a workforce of more than 500 slaves. The Y Plantation was completely self-sufficient, and that self-sufficiency depended on black hands. The blacksmiths, the carpenters, the people who worked in the fields, the coachmen, the cooks, the maids, the butlers. Everything that was done on the Y plantation was done by black hands. In the world into which Frederick Douglass was born, slavery was a time-honored American institution 
200 years old. More than one million Africans and African Americans like himself were considered property. They were bought and sold and were bred like cattle. saw her fourth child, Frederick, only when she could manage to walk the 24-mile round trip from the fields of a neighboring farm to Y Plantation after her long work day. His mother represents what a terrible thing slavery can do to a family, to a community. But his mother, of course, also represents what a beautiful thing it is for a mother to determine to see her son, whatever she has to do to make that possible. Frederick's mother died before he was nine years old. He later wrote, her grave was like those lost at sea, without a marker or a stake. She died, he said, never revealing the identity of his father. It could be the case that Douglas's father was an unknown man. He could have been an overseer. He could have been a white man who worked for the family that Harriet Bailey worked for. Because as far as sexuality was concerned, in the white South, it was open season on black women. And that tragedy is something that haunted Douglas as well. Slavery does away with fathers as it does away with families. The name of the child is not expected to be that of his father. He may be white, glorying in the purity of his Anglo-Saxon blood, and his child may be ranked with the blackest of slaves. Indeed, he may be, and often is, master to the same child. Douglas would later write that slavery had made his mother a myth and his father a mystery. A little nearer to my old masters stood a very long, rough, low building, literally alive with slaves of all ages, conditions, and sizes. They would sometimes sing. They breathed the prayer and complaint of souls boiling over with the bitterest anguish. Every tone was a testimony against slavery and a prayer to God for deliverance from chains. those songs I trace my first glimmering conception of the dehumanizing character of slavery. And Douglas saw firsthand the cruelty of slavery. He saw his Aunt Hester beaten cruelly. He saw one slave who waded out into the water to get away from the overseer's last simply shot in the head for that. So Douglas gives us firsthand our most graphic picture of what bondage does to the human spirit. As I grew older and more thoughtful, I was more and more filled with a sense of my wretchedness, the terrible reports of wrong and outrage which came to my ear together with what I almost daily witnessed led me but when eight or nine years old to wish I had never been born. In the summer of 1826, Frederick was sent north across the Chesapeake Bay to Baltimore to work for Hugh Auld and his wife, Sophia. For the rest of his life, he would think of himself as chosen, not by chance, not by luck, 
but by divine providence. In the home of Sophia Old, young Frederick was no longer treated as property, but treated as a child. He slept in a bed for the first time, took meals with the family, and was encouraged to speak his mind. Well, from Sophia Auld, his mistress in Baltimore at about the age of 10, he receives the gift of words. She teaches him his letters. And for about a year, he is given the freedom to read and continue to inscribe in his booklets. But after about a year, his master, Hugh Auld, her husband, discovers this in part because it's the law that you are not to teach slaves to read and write, and in part, I suspect, because you all was threatened by that. Uh, you all laid down the law and declared that Douglas shall not be taught to read and write. Learning would spoil the best nigger in the world. If you learn him how to read, he'll want to know how to write. And this accomplished, he'll be running away with himself. Douglas later on referred to that as the first anti-slavery lecture he ever heard, because Hugh Auld's analysis was absolutely on target. He was describing what would eventually uh, kill off slavery. It would be when uh, black people came to have the power to articulate um, their grievances. When forbidden to read in the Auld home, Frederick carried a Webster's spelling book into the street, asking help from his white friends, bribing them with food when he had to. Letter by letter, he mastered the rest of the alphabet, and by age 12, had learned to read and write. Eventually, he got himself into a bookstore and bought the Columbian Orator, one of that most important of all books in his life. He would go down behind the, the warehouses somewhere all by himself, and uh, really, that's how he taught himself to be an orator. He just memorized those speeches. Douglas, from that point on, was just in love with words, in love with reading. He hid, he hid books in his pocket, pieces of paper in his pocket, and he read everywhere he could possibly, everything he could possibly read. As I read, behold, the very discontent so graphically predicted by Master Auld had come upon me. Knowledge had come, light had penetrated the moral dungeon where I dwelt. One hundred and fifty miles south of Baltimore, a slave named Nat Turner turned the written word into a sword. Preaching that passages from the Bible foretold rebellion, he led a band of slaves against the town of Jerusalem, Virginia, killing 57 white men, women, and children before he was captured and hanged. In the aftermath, Southern states passed even stricter laws against slaves learning to read or becoming ministers or holding prayer meetings out of the sight of white people. What happens when you have a rebellion like Nat Turner's rebellion is that the entire countryside, indeed the entire South, is up in arms. And every black man, woman, and child is a target. And the repression is immense. There is death, there is torture, there is fear, there is suspicion. Every black is a rebel. In 1831, the same year that Nat Turner marched on Virginia, young Frederick experienced his own religious conversion. While thus religiously seeking knowledge, I became acquainted with an old colored man named Lawson. He fanned my already intense love of knowledge into a flame by assuring me that I was to be a useful man in the world. When I would ask him, how can these things be? His simple reply was, trust in the Lord. It is this Father Lawson who identifies for Douglas, in a sense, a deep piece of his calling to take the spoken word and the written word and to meld them together into a great 
weapon on behalf of freedom. At age 15, Frederick Bailey was ordered back to Y Plantation. His new master, Thomas Auld, wanted him hired out as a field hand and sent him to work for Edward Covey, a farmer with a reputation for breaking difficult slaves. What we've got here now with Douglas living with Edward Covey is a, is a teenage slave who is not only disobedient, but is in despair. Uh, he, he's clearly a very thoughtful young man at this point, but he, sees, he has seen the rest of his life. And he's seen that the rest of his life may mean that he's a field hand. He almost broke Douglas. He worked him night and day, and uh, he threatened him, and used words of intimidation and violence, and, and Douglas was on the, on the edge of being broken, and on the edge of being made into a meek and humble slave. It was the whip, the sting of the lash that Covey used to control young Frederick. But after six months of beatings and work in Covey's fields, Frederick decided to be beaten no more. Mr. Covey seemed now to think he had me and could do what he pleased. But at this moment, from whence came the spirit, I don't know, I resolved to fight. This battle with Mr. Covey was the turning point in my career as a slave. It revived within me a sense of my own manhood. I did not hesitate to let it be known of me that the white man who expected to succeed in whipping must also succeed in killing me. Covey never reported the incident, probably to protect his own reputation as a Negro breaker. At year's end, the teenager was hired out to another farm where he organized 20 or 30 young men into a secret school. Using the same speller and Colombian orator he had carried from Baltimore, he began the dangerous and illegal work of teaching other slaves to read and to plan for escape. Douglas is living parallel with Nat Turner. In many ways, he is a marked man because he's living now in a South that has been highly sensitized to the charismatic leader, to the preacher of the word, to the teacher who takes the biblical word and transforms it into something that the slave commun the slave owning community never intended. In the secrecy of the woods, Frederick and five other slaves met every Sunday. There they planned an escape across the Chesapeake, but were betrayed and thrown into jail. Townspeople called for the teenager to be hanged and burned, or like Nat Turner, skinned and displayed. It was Frederick who could read and write. Frederick who had written the passes. The pressure to get rid of him fell on his owner, Thomas Auld. His wife was after him to sell him south. His father-in-law was after him to, you know, get a dangerous slave out of here and sell him um, away in, into the deep south. And Thomas Old doesn't do it. He sends him to Baltimore. Frederick again felt some power had interceded in his life. Instead of death or the cruel life of a Mississippi field hand, he was hired out to work in a shipyard but his mind was still fixed on freedom. To plan an escape, one had to be extremely careful and one needed a lot of good friends. One needed to be cunning, crafty, careful. Uh, one needed good disguises. Uh, mostly one needed a great deal of courage. No man can tell the intense agony which is felt by the slave when wavering on the point of making his escape. All that he has is at stake, and even that which he has not is at stake also. 
the life which he has may be lost, and the liberty which he seeks may not be gained. In Baltimore, Frederick met Anna Murray, a free black woman from the eastern shore of Maryland who worked as a housekeeper and used her savings to help with his escape. Working closely with a secret society that aided fugitive slaves, Frederick devised a careful plan. He would disguise himself as a sailor using travel papers borrowed from a free seaman. He would travel by train to Havre de Grace, Maryland, then cross the Susquehanna by ferry, take another train to Wilmington, Delaware, and finally board a steamboat to Philadelphia. On September 3rd, 1838, Frederick Bailey, carrying his copy of the Columbian Orator, crossed into freedom. Once he was free, Frederick and Anna were married. The couple traveled north to New Bedford, Massachusetts, a Quaker town with a large fugitive population. There, to avoid the attention of slave catchers, he chose a new last name. From Sir Walter Scott's book, Lady of the Lake, Frederick Bailey became Frederick Douglass. I think at that point, Douglass felt secure, felt relatively safe because he's living in a community with a large number of fugitive slaves and with, a, with an abolitionist tradition. And he probably wanted to remain uh, an essentially private man. In four or five months after reaching New Bedford, there came a young man to me with a copy of The Liberator the paper edited by William Lloyd Garrison. The Liberator was a paper after my own heart. It detested slavery. It preached human brotherhood, denounced oppression, and demanded the complete emancipation of my race. I not only liked, I loved this paper and its editor. Garrison, president of the American Anti-Slavery Society, was an uncompromising radical who publicly burned copies of the U.S. Constitution while denouncing it as a pro-slavery document. The Garrisonians invited Douglas to the abolitionist convention at the Antheneum in Nantucket. There, Douglas was asked to tell his story of bondage to freedom. I was induced to speak out the feelings inspired by the occasion and the fresh recollections of the scenes through which I had passed as a slave. It was with the utmost difficulty that I could stand erect or that I could command and articulate two words without hesitation and stammering. I trembled in every limb. Moved by Douglas's depiction of slave life, Garrison asked him to become a full-time lecturer for the American Anti-Slavery Society. Despite the risk in publicly identifying himself as a fugitive slave, Douglas joined the Garrisonians, crisscrossing New England to tell his story. That relationship with Garrison and this band of radical moralist abolitionists becomes, in a sense, the anti-slavery church, the anti-slavery family in which Frederick Douglass found his feet and found his voice, found his own kind of critique of slavery and of America, that he now would be hired to go out and practice on the abolitionist circuit uh, week in and week out. Many came, no doubt from curiosity, to hear what a Negro could say in his own cause. I was generally introduced as a chattel, a thing, a piece of Southern property. The chairman assuring the crowd that it could speak. Here's this 24 year old man just out of slavery standing on the platform tall erect with his great voice and his great presence taking his audiences to slave row and he could make them see and feel the sweat and the color and the pain and the joy and the tears of slave row <laughs> 
the audiences all over the country recognized that here was a master who could reveal slavery in a way that nobody had ever done before. Everyone wanted to hear the Frederick Douglass story. The burden of that, of course, is that he had to be a symbol. He had to be somehow the slave come to, come to flesh, the slave come to life. In a sense, he had to stand there and, and, and demonstrate his pain publicly. Douglas had to contend with an America that viewed descendants of Africa as inferior beings, three-fifths a person not worthy of equal participation in the society. Traveling New England, he was denied seats on trains, tables in restaurants, rooms in hotels. Douglas and the other black abolitionists uh, had to fight Jim Crow in the North, as well as slavery in the South. And having to wage this twin struggle, I think gave them a greater sense and a greater feeling for, for the depth of the racial problem in America. Let us have the facts, said the people. We will take care of the philosophy. Be yourself and tell your story. Better to have a little of the plantation manner of speech than not. It's not best you seem to learn it. I could not always obey if I was now reading and thinking. It did not entirely satisfy me to narrate wrongs. I felt like denouncing them. I was growing and needed room. He particularly resented it when they thought he ought to sound more simple. He ought to sound more like a darkie. He was not about to sound anywhere, any way other than the way he wanted to sound. He wanted to speak elegantly. He knew how to speak elegantly, and he was going to do so, and, and did. At last, the apprehended trouble came. People doubted if I had ever been a slave. They said I did not talk like a slave, look like a slave, nor act like a slave, and that they believed I had never been south of the Mason and Dixon line. In 1845, Douglas published Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, written by himself. Risking recapture, he used real names, real places to authenticate his journey from slavery to freedom. Those who could write, those who could wield words, those who could tell their own history were authentic people. Those who had a history were authentic people. Now, Douglas had been doing that on platforms, but now he could put it on paper. He could take it out and say, here's my story, read it. To tell that story means to put yourself at great risk. Because you are now proclaiming to the world that you have broken the laws of the nation. That, that you are, according to the American constitutional law, you are contraband and you are proclaiming it from the housetops and you are therefore in danger the anti-slavery society concerned for douglas's safety and interested in capitalizing on his popularity arranged for a speaking tour overseas douglas sailed for britain in august 1845 remaining behind in lynn massachusetts were his four children and his wife anna My dear friend Garrison, one of the most pleasing features of my visit thus far has been a total absence of all manifestations of prejudice against me. I go on stagecoaches, steamships, into the first cabin. I find myself not treated as a color, but as a man. In great haste, ever yours, Frederick Douglass. the people of, of England were just overwhelmed by Douglas. And lords and ladies and aristocratic people flocked to his, his lectures and um, tried to get close to him and to, 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 to talk to him because they were just tremendously impressed by, by what, he, what he was. Before British audiences, Douglas waged war on American hypocrisy condemning America's founding fathers and institutions for supporting slavery. 
As news of his speeches reached the United States, the American press condemned him, calling him a paid extremist. I am aware that the wisdom of exposing the sins of one nation in the ear of another has been seriously questioned by good and clear-sighted people. However, the system of slavery is such a giant sin, so destructive to the moral sense, that I feel not only at liberty but abundantly justified in appealing to the whole world to aid in its removal. He was not a voice, uh, he was not a presence that any particular reform movement could easily control. And I think it was in England that he found this new independence, and it's indeed his British friends who actually buy his freedom for him, his legal freedom. And that, I think, is where this, uh, this, uh, this quest for an independent public career uh, probably began. His British friends paid Thomas Old 150 pounds for the freedom of his slave named Frederick Bailey. Many of Douglas's closest allies attacked him for trafficking with slaveholders. But he responded by saying that his freedom was worth more than the price paid. At age 29, after almost two years in exile, Douglas returned to the United States, a free man and an international celebrity. Anna Douglas had made a home for her family in Lynn, Massachusetts for six years. But soon after her husband's return from Europe, he announced his intention to move to Rochester, New York, and start a newspaper. It must have been extremely difficult for Anna Murray as a wife and as a mother. She was fettered because she was not a reader and a writer. So as he moved into the world that revolved around text, and revolved around public speaking and revolved ar around a kind of gentlemanly uh, presentation, she could only keep up with part of that. Douglas started his four-page weekly with the help of $2,500 raised by his British friends. Garrison, the editor of The Liberator, saw Douglas's newspaper as competition and discouraged him from publishing it. There were times when I almost thought my Boston friends were right in dissuading me from my newspaper project. But under the circumstances, it was the best school possible for me. It obliged me to think and read. It made it necessary for me to lean upon myself and not upon the heads of our anti-slavery church, to be a principal, not an agent. This is a movement to free slaves. And former slaves fugitive slaves, and free African Americans ought to be in the vanguard of that movement. And so a black voice was crucial as a vanguard voice because this was, in essence, a black struggle. And Douglas, because of his popularity, because of his skills, was best able to fill that. Douglas is a phenomenon that deeply affects the anti-slavery movement in this country because he simply comes on the scene and bursts like a great uh, star to which everything else must now reposition itself. From the beginning, Douglas's North Star took bold positions on issues of class and race and gender. In 1848, he came out strongly for the right of women to have the vote the abolitionist movement before it became a movement that influential white males were involved in was a movement that white women had advocated. So Douglas very shrewdly capitalized on that. That was part of the reason he moved to Rochester because there was a very strong abolitionist center there and that center was female. In respect to political rights, we hold woman to be justly entitled to all we claim for man. There can be no reason in the world for denying to woman the exercise of the elective franchise. Our doctrine is that right is of no sex. 
By the end of the 1840s, Douglas no longer spoke for the Garrisonians. He was now the voice of his people. He attacked plans to return black people to Africa, called for political action to end slavery, and in a speech in Boston, he made it clear that he no longer shared Garrison's confidence that moral suasion could end slavery. I should welcome the intelligence tomorrow, should it come, that the slaves had risen in the South, and that the sable arms which had been engaged in beautifying and adorning the South were engaged in spreading death and devastation. There's a very rich debate among black abolitionists and white abolitionists by the late 1840s about violence as a tactic, about plans of organized insurrection, if it could be done, uh, about trying to influence party politics, of, of trying to use the United States Constitution in a radical reading of it uh, as a means of applying pressure to the United States government. Since rising to speak in Nantucket, he had been loyal to Garrison's interpretation of the U.S. Constitution as a document that protected the property rights of every white American to own slaves. But in 1849, Douglas angered Garrison by announcing that the Constitution's promise of liberty for all should be used to fight slavery. Garrison openly attacked him and removed the North Star from his organization's reading list. Douglas, by the time of their break, had come to the conclusion that the movement should be black-led. He had come to the conclusion that while the Liberator, Garrison's newspaper, the anti-slavery standard and the anti-slavery bugle were all very important, that again you needed a black voice. And he was the maker of that voice. In 1850, Northern and Southern congressmen debated whether the new Western territories would be slave states or free. A compromise was reached. The North succeeded in limiting the expansion of slavery. The South obtained a new fugitive slave law, guaranteeing federal support for owners coming North to retrieve runaways. The new law was written so broadly it put every black person in danger. The African-American community of the North is in turmoil. And it does literally mean husbands being dragged away from their families mothers being taken away from their children, whole families being sent south. Douglas now joins a wave of change among abolitionists because now resistance to slavery becomes self-defense. Uh, the, the use of violence becomes uh, the protection of a fugitive slave escaping through your town. And it's at that point that Douglas becomes very, very active in the Underground Railroad. And this becomes, aside from his newspaper activities, his most important mission is to get slaves not only out of the South, but out of the South, out of the North, and to Canada. In the first three months after passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, thousands of black men, women, and children from Northern states crossed into Canada. In 1852, Douglas was asked to speak in commemoration of the 4th of July. In protest, he spoke on the 5th, calling the 4th White America's Independence Day, a holiday they could rejoice, but he must mourn. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds itself to be false to the future. 
Go where you may, search where you will, roam all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world, travel through South America, search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts by the side of the everyday practices of this nation, and you will say with me that, for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. Those persons who are descendants of Africans who were imported into this country and sold as slaves were not intended to be included under the word citizen in the Constitution and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument allows. In 1857, U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice Roger B. Taney declared in the Dred Scott case that a black man had no rights in an American court of law and no rights which the white man was bound to respect. He also decided that the U.S. Congress could not restrict the expansion of slavery. If the fugitive slave law politicized Douglas, Dred Scott radicalized him. Basically, what the decision said was that you're not a citizen, you never will be, you will have to live in this country as a bond person. And this is coming from the highest law in the land, the Constitution. So what else is open to a black man except radical resistance? Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, and it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. In 1859, Frederick Douglass journeyed to a secret meeting place in Pennsylvania, near the Virginia border, to talk with his friend John Brown, a 59-year-old zealot consumed by the idea of destroying slavery. Brown told Douglass of a plan to attack the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, a small town west of Washington, D.C., and to use the captured weapons to arm freed slaves and make war on slaveholders. John Brown trying to persuade him to come with him and Douglas arguing against the plan, saying in effect that it was an impractical and that uh, it was strategically unwise. There was evidently something of futility in what John Brown was doing. There was something that told Douglas this is not going to win. This is not the way. On October 16th, Brown led 13 white and 5 black volunteers into Harper's Ferry and seized control of the arsenal. After 36 hours of fighting, U.S. Marines under the command of Colonel Robert E. Lee stormed the building, capturing Brown and a handful of survivors. Brown was quickly tried and convicted of murder, treason, and conspiring with slaves to rebel. On the second day of December, 1859, John Brown was hanged. Brown was a kind of vanguard, a kind of point man for, for abolitionists who themselves would never have organized a band of warriors to march into the South, but this man would. He was useful uh, in very real ways to abolitionists like Frederick Douglass who now dreamed about and wished for some kind of breakup of the American Union. A letter in Brown's possession implied that Douglas knew in advance about the raid. Governor Wise of Virginia called for his immediate arrest. With U.S. Marshals on his trail, Douglas escaped to Canada and then to England. <laughs> 
He heard from dear father last week, and his grief was great. I trust the next letter will evince more composure of mind. In England, Douglas received word of the death of his youngest child, Annie. Although still fearful of arrest, he boarded the first steamer back to America to be with Anna and their remaining four children. By this time, luckily, the Congress had decided uh, to try to cool it after the John Brown raid and decided not to pursue indictments of any possible conspirators. And he comes back into the country, does kind of back, come back quietly through Maine and across Canada and back down into Rochester. November 1860, Abraham Lincoln campaigning on the slogan, No More Slave States, was elected president. In South Carolina, the Charleston Mercury announced, The revolution of 1860 has been initiated. Five months later, in Charleston Harbor, Southern troops opened fire on Fort Sumter. The national argument over slavery was now civil war. The fate of the greatest of all modern republics trembles in the balance. The lesson of the hour is written down in the characters of blood and fire. We are taught, as with the emphasis of an earthquake, that nations not less than individuals are subjects of the moral government of the universe and that persistent transgressions of the laws of this divine government will certainly bring national sorrow, shame, suffering, and death. Of all the nations of the world, we seem most in need of this solemn lesson. War is a horrifying, dirty, nasty, terrible thing, but one has to be clear on this. Douglas welcomed the Civil War. He believed that this was the, this was the, the much prophesied uh, coming of a, of a rending of America and a, and a war that of necessity would have to be made on slavery and on slaveholders. In editorials, in speeches, in letters, Douglas repeated that the Negro is the key of the situation, the pivot upon which the whole rebellion turns. Douglas challenged President Lincoln to declare this a war to end slavery. But although the president saw slavery as a moral wrong, he believed the real key to peace was the removal of black people from America. You and we are different races. We have between us a broader difference than exists between almost any other two races. We should be separated. But for your race among us, there could not be war. Though elected as an anti-slavery man by the Republican and abolitionist voters, Mr. Lincoln is quite a genuine representative of American prejudice and Negro hatred, and far more concerned with the preservation of slavery than the principle of justice and humanity. Douglas wanted Lincoln and the nation to see slavery as a threat to the liberty of all Americans, white and black. Only then, he believed, would the nation act to end it. Douglas and many of the abolitionists realize that something is going to come out of this war, and it's going to have to do with the end of slavery. And so they push for that. They appeal to Lincoln. They basically bombard Lincoln with petitions. The war has started. Now free the slaves. Now free the slaves. Lincoln is inundated with that demand day and night. Lincoln feared he would lose popular support for the war if it became a fight to end slavery. But in September 1862, as an act of military necessity, he announced he would issue an Emancipation Proclamation. Although the proclamation did not abolish slavery nationally and freed only slaves in rebel territory, Douglas and many others applauded this major step toward freedom. There are certain great national acts which by their relation to the universal principle belong to the whole human family. 
in Abraham Lincoln's proclamation on the 1st of January, 1863, is one of these acts. If the war indeed was going to take on the issue of slavery, and if the war was being carried out against those who were supporting slavery, then black people ought to have the opportunity to participate as soldiers uh, in, in the war. Once let the black man get upon his person the brass letters U.S. Let him get an eagle on his buttons and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. And there is no power on earth which can deny that he has earned full citizenship in the United States. In the proclamation, Lincoln declared that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States. Lincoln needed recruits to save the Union. Douglas needed black men to win their own freedom. The 54th Massachusetts, the organization of this regiment for which Douglas recruited some 100 members, became the, the, the living reality of emancipation. They were the, the symbols now of, of, of a war that was clearly destined to destroy slavery. And it must have been with both great fear and with great pride that Douglas could put his own two young sons in that regiment. I think it was exhilarating for Douglas to see his son as a Union soldier. And I think that was the case with many of the African Americans, especially those who had struggled so long in leadership positions to bring that war to fruition. In the last years of the Civil War, 179,000 black men fought for their freedom. 38,000 lost their lives. In those same years, Douglas called on the nation to create a new order built on the ashes of the old. An America where the Declaration of Independence was no longer a lie. Douglas hoped that America might be the place that he could give witness to as a great nation. He saw its possibilities, he saw its potentials, and he was willing to struggle for the nation to become a great nation with black people making powerful contributions to the building of that, of that kind of nation. On January 31st, 1865, with the war's end in sight, the U.S. Congress passed the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery in all of the United States. Douglas, at 47 years old, had witnessed his people's journey from bondage to freedom. As the nation recovered from its most costly war, he again seized the moment to deliver a lesson for the hour. The hour is one of hope as well as danger. But whatever comes to pass, one thing is clear. The necessities of both sections of the country and every suggestion of enlightened policy demand the enfranchisement of the entire colored population of the country. I end where I begin. No war but an abolition war. No peace but an abolition peace. Frederick Douglass, when the lion wrote history, will return in a moment. This is PBS, the public broadcasting service.